This remastered film is about a Heritage era club trip to France in 1994 to celebrate the 50th anniversary of D-Day. It was filmed using a first generation 8mm analogue tape camcorder in what was then the standard 4.3 format. On this trip there are many long-standing members of the Aero Club who are sadly no longer with us. You will spot some of our present members though. It starts with an extract from Bill Clinton's speech made at the US National Cemetery in Normandy on the 6th of June 1994. Today, the beaches of Normandy are calm. If you walk these shores on a summer's day, all you might hear is the laughter of children playing on the sand or the cry of seagulls overhead or perhaps the ringing of a distant church bell. The simple sounds of freedom barely breaking the silence. Peaceful sounds, ordinary sounds. But June 6, 1944 was the least ordinary day of the 20th century. On that chill dawn, these beaches echoed with the sounds of staccato gunfire, the roar of aircraft, the thunder of bombardment. And through the wind and the waves came the soldiers out of their landing craft and into the water, away from their youth and toward a savage place. Many of them would sadly never leave. They had come to free a continent. The Americans, the British, the Canadians, the Poles, the French resistance, the Norwegians and others. They had all come to stop one of the greatest forces of evil the world has ever known. Today, many of them are here among us. Oh, they may walk with a little less spring in their step and their ranks are growing thinner. But let us never forget when they were young, these men saved the world. It was on a wet, windy and overcast morning when we all arrived at Coventry Airport for our trip to Deauville and the 50th anniversary celebrations of D-Day. The trip, including the flights in the DC-3, the accommodation and coach trips, had been arranged over the previous 12 months by Henry and Baron Maiden. Everyone had arrived by 8.15am and we were all looking forward to our interesting weekend, the canteen providing us with tea and breakfasts. Departure time at 9.30am saw us walking out to Papa Zulu, a Douglas Dakota DC-3. We could have all been transported back to the 1940s. A 45-year-old aeroplane taking us to France, how superb. We took off from runway 23 and with the tail coming up we became airborne before the intersection. As we climbed slowly into the low cloud base of 800 foot, all our thoughts were on what was in store for us for the weekend ahead. The route from Coventry took us on a direct track to the Westcott NDB, to Farnborough, and then a direct track to the coast. Papa Zulu was cruising at 135 knots at 2,500 foot on the regional pressure setting. 
we were going in and out of IMC. We descended to 2,000 foot to remain below the London TMA and the weather improved. But unfortunately as we approached the coast this didn't last long. Crossing the coast of Beam Worthing we continued to cross the English Channel and our destination of Deauville. Approaching the coast we began our descent and because of the poor weather carried out an instant approach to land. Arriving in the wind and rain, we disembarked into the terminal and waited for a coach to take us to our accommodation. We were staying in the holiday apartment blocks in the coastal town of Villa sur mer the town being situated 7 kilometres southwest of Deauville and was in the perfect position to act as our base for the weekend. Besides the apartments, the centre of the complex consisted of several shops and of course a bar, where we all headed for our first drink on French soil. Our apartment was very basic and comprised of a kitchen area, a bathroom, two bunk beds, a settee and of course a floor. But it was all we needed for the weekend. Sunday morning saw several hangovers but we were all up early waiting for our coach to take us on our planned D-Day itinerary. Our first stop was Herman Veal Military Cemetery. To see the veterans and families looking for the graves of their colleagues and family loved ones was very emotional and poignant. To read the headstones and see how young our soldiers and airmen were when they lost their lives in this conflict made me feel very privileged to have lived in a war-free European zone for my lifetime. Hermanville I will never forget. Juno Beach was one of the five beaches of the Allied invasion on the 6th of June 1944. Taking Juno was the responsibility of the 3rd Infantry of the Canadian Army under the command of General R.F. Keller. Its objectives were to cut the Caen Bayer Road, seize the airport west of Caen and form a link between the two British beaches on either flank. By the end of the day, the Canadian Division had succeeded in pushing further inland than any other landing force on D-Day. On this anniversary, many enthusiasts had brought their immaculately restored vehicles for everyone to see and admire. To 
commemorate the taking of the beach by the Canadians, several wreaths, plaques and monuments had been placed along the promenade, all in honour of the soldiers and airmen who gave the ultimate sacrifice in freeing Europe from its tyranny. Pegasus Bridge was the first objective of D-Day. It was to be captured and held until relieved by the troops of the 6th Airborne Division. Is that the cafe over yes. there? The Café Gondre was the first house to be liberated in France. The glider assault on Pegasus Bridge was commanded by Major Don Howard. He led the first Allied troops on the ground on D-Day. A reconnaissance photograph shows the landing position of the three gliders carrying the assault party. Howard's total force to capture the bridge and the River Orne comprised six platoons of the Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire Light Infantry. In all, 181 men plus pilots and six horse gliders. The gliders crossed the French coast seven seconds into D-Day. The precision with which the gliders hit their targets was remarkable. The first glider landed 47 yards from the bridge at night and without any landing aid. Today, the taking of the bridge was commemorated by the newly formed band of the Army Air Corps and the Ox and Bucks like infantry in their ceremonial uniforms. The crowd around the bridge had been assembling all morning but we had arrived just before the crossing. Major John Howard can be seen behind the band in a wheelchair being pushed by his horse glider pilot, Sergeant Jim Warwick. Following behind are the veterans of the road. It was a day of veterans and they all had a story to tell. Three Lynx helicopters were positioned in the field next to the bridge, representing the land and areas of the three horse gliders. The exact positions being marked by three plinths and plaques. While people were remembering the past, a Dakota flew over. This being the last one in service in the RAF and part of the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight. It dropped 18 very distinguished parachutists, all senior members of the Parachute Regiment. The first out being David Parker, the Regimental Colonel. Suddenly a Hercules appeared, not one, but 17. 12 from the RAF, 3 from the Canadian and 2 from the French Air Forces. At half-second intervals, 40 men using modern-day low-level parachutes were dropped. Over 500 men in the first wave, all dropping into the original landing zone. After the first drop, the Hercules entered a left-hand holding pattern before returning for a second drop. Quoting from Bill Clinton's speech in 1994, 50 years ago, the first Allied soldiers to land here in Normandy came not from the sea, but from the sky. They were called Pathfinders, the first paratroopers to make the jump. Deep in the darkness they descended upon these fields to light beacons for the airborne assaults that would soon follow. Now, near the dawn of a new century, the job of lighting these beacons falls to our hands. After the last parachutist had been dropped, the three Lynx helicopters prepared to leave. 
Back in the coach and after our very enjoyable and tiring day, many fell asleep on our way back to base. Meanwhile, our faithful DC-3, Papa Zulu, was flying overhead. They weren't concerned about the traffic jam we were in. After spending the morning in small groups visiting Troville, we packed and made our way to the square and cafe for one final drink and to wait for our coach to take us back to the airport. This is the man that organised it. It was interesting listening to everyone's views on the weekend and their different accommodations. I've lost the jacket. <laughs> you have. There's a captain wrong film, Captain. <laughs> A poster was produced and we all signed it, hoping this would appear in the Aero Club bar on our return. We were all looking forward to the flight home. Doville Airport had become an American base for the weekend. Movements were occurring every few minutes, mostly by helicopter, and there was a high level of security, unusual for a small French airport. The weather was not good with a low cloud base and all incoming and outgoing flights were operating under instrument flight rules. We estimated the cloud base of the low stratus to be around 500 foot after watching a BA-111 takeoff. The whole of the runway was required when a Boeing 707 came into land. Touchdown was firm and even with reverse thrust, speed brakes and hard braking, it took the majority of the runway to stop. It was rumoured that this was Air Force 3, one of the presidential fleet. After taxiing and parking, only four people disembarked. Our DC-3, Papa Zulu, was the next to land. Descending gracefully towards the runway, it landed smoothly on its main wheels before allowing the tail to drop. The Dakota was the most extensively deployed transport aircraft of the Second World War, under the designation of the C-47 Skytrain or Dakota. This low-wing cantilever monoplane was built in great quantities for the United States Air Force and its allies. No fewer than 10,000 were produced by the end of the war. It has a wingspan of 95 feet, an all-up weight of 25,200 pounds, a maximum speed of 230 miles an hour at 8,500 foot and a maximum range of 2,125 miles. It is powered by two 1,200 horsepower Pratt & Whitney radial engines. Duty-free call before embarking, allowing several members to purchase the usual items. The turnaround was incredibly quick and the engines were started 20 minutes after landing. Takeoff again was smooth and we slowly climbed the low stratus and turned on track for the flight home.
It had been a wonderful flight back and we all disembarked into the bright blue sky at Coventry Airport. The pilot signed our poster and we all made our way into the terminal to clear customs and find our transport home. What a way to celebrate the 50th anniversary of D-Day.